aging and make it easier to access databases that otherwise just live on some file system somewhere. Um, given that this is a short talk, I'll just show you a couple of so, uh, screenshots of some of the applications and then talk about larger questions that hopefully will inform the panel discussion. This is an ongoing project called NeuroCave, or was originally called NeuroCave. Now we're retitling it TempoCave because we're focusing on the human brain connectome and specifically dynamic human brain connectomes, which are uh, networks of connections in the brain that are um, derived from MRI, from temporal MRI scans. And uh, one thing I often do in my work is I use, uh, or I try to use when I can, use new technologies such as immersive technology, VR, augmented reality, um, to make the data more uh, engaging and more accessible and more easy to query from different perspectives. This is an ongoing project with, I believe I saw Xavier Prochaska in the audience uh, in the astrophysics department. We're working with Joe Burchett and some of my students to visualize um, uh, what are called quasar sight lines, data that has been uh, measured using the Hubble telescope to, uh, and to extract spectra, which can give us some information about the intergalactic media and circumgalactic media that surround galaxies very, very far away, which then the astrophysicists use to uh, reason about the evolution of the universe and the makeup of the, of the universe. And this is an ongoing project uh, with uh, Walter Fontana of Harvard Medical School, who's a systems biologist who tries to define um, biochemical rules that um, define various intracellular cellular processes inside human cells. As I mentioned, I also work with uh, uh, cultural uh, data sets and uh, with media artists. I myself am a media artist. This is a project in collaboration with the School of the Art Institute at Chicago and the Chicago History Museum, where we designed an augmented reality interface on a cell phone or a tablet, where you can walk along the um, Chicago River in downtown Chicago and superimpose data that was taken, photographs that were taken in 1915, 1916, and superimpose them onto contemporary architectural features. So some of these buildings were existing in 1915. And when we find a match, we can pull from the database and actually superimpose these archival photos or videos on top of that architecture. Um, so the goals of information visualization tools, generally speaking, are to enhance the ability of humans to find patterns in data, which I guess is maybe is the goal of all data science. But in visualization, obviously, there's a visual representation component. And so I, as a visualization research researcher, try to identify salient features of the data and then choose or experiment with choosing appropriate visual encodings or visual representations that are most e easily perceivable by humans, by our human visual system. So there's an element of perceptual science, and there's an element of creativity, there's an element of data analysis, and getting that all to work together to create something that helps a user make sense of often their own complicated data. Of course, there's threats and, and issues when you create a data visualization, and um, Maybe the primary one is that the patterns you are trying to make explicit are sometimes or perhaps always in some way based on data that is inherently inaccurate. It's sampled, right? It's incomplete and may be biased in various ways, which I know some of our panel will be speaking about in more detail. So I try to advocate for a human-centered uh, design practice when creating visualization tools, which means I focus on um, iterative processes, I try and think through who the audience is, I try and think through some of these limitations of the data. And while I believe it's important to have, I mean very important to have a visualization tool that helps you reason about difficult data, I've come more and more to realize that this process of getting to that point is actually maybe the most important part of the research I do. Through talking to scientists and researchers and analysts, it's a space where you can think about some of these issues more critically, um, which helps to prioritize analysis tasks helps you think about the most effective ways to present and reason about the data, and also uh, lets the researchers think about the limitations, potentially, of their data, which can inspire new research or new data collection. So I thought I'd just ask some high-level questions, which, again, might inform. Oh, I do want to say that some of those slides I showed will be um, shown at the poster session uh, later today. So, please. so to get more information about some of those, uh, my students will be talking about these projects, and they also, in addition to the posters, they will have a laptop with some demos so you can try them out. So one of the questions, um, or one of the points I like to make to my students and to people I speak to is that rep just representing something is not really sufficient in a data visualization. Uh, and the question I ask is, so what if you can see it if you don't understand it? 
Um, what insight does the data give us about the systems or system it represents? And there's an issue there sometimes just by the act of representing it, it creates this false impression that there's some actual insight or understanding where really you might just have a pretty picture. So that's an important thing to think about. Incisive interpretation of data is more important than the raw data itself. And the questions I ask here are how do we decide what to do with the data? What does the data mean to whom and in what contexts? Data transparency and effective data communication is an important part of the data science process or the data analysis process. Um, and tools to filter, clean, interpret, transform, or visualize the raw data um, or the pre-processed data may introduce bias and obscure or distort some of the meanings in that data. And so we have to be aware of that as data scientists. And my last point is that critical thinking is, of course, informed by understanding by, understand, by understanding how humans model the world, but more and more by how machines and algorithms are modeling the world. And as uh, responsible data scientists and responsible data visualizationists, uh, we need to, need to be thinking critically about the rise of algorithms which are doing some of this work for us in our stead, but we're still responsible for it. So um, uh, briefly, how, how can we create visualization design and visual analytics tools? that provide information about the context of the data, that emphasize the province, provenance of the data, which is where it came from, how trustworthy it is, who created it, how was it sampled, to enable users to explore and to update the underlying models of the data in order to facilitate new interpretation, um, to represent ambiguity and uncertainty or to depict probabilistic functionality. Data, a lot of data is inherently uncertain. Um, and providing an, an extra visual encoding that shows that can complicate the ability to per perceive it, but I think is important in order to be able to actually assess um, its meaning. I want my visualizations to take advantage of the innate human ability to make sense of the world through storytelling and through narrative. And I, again, visualization, the act of making a visualization in and of itself encourages collaborations between researchers with varying uh, perspectives. So on that note, I'll end, and I'm happy to take questions during the panel. Thank you.